Welcome to Educate, Agitate, Organise Saturday. Uh, this is a weekly programme that's a joint collaboration between Don't Leave Organise and Socialist Telly, where we have on campaigns and campaigners from around the country talking about really important issues. Really pleased to uh, be joined again by Jane Aitchison, my co-host for this week. Jane, who have we got on this week? We've got on uh, Emma and Catherine from Leeds, two disabled activists, and we've also got Ellen uh, Clifford on again to talk to us in response to their interviews. Uh, and we got fantastic feedback last week from the interview with Ellen, and I think we'll be talking today about uh, why disabled people are made to feel invisible, particularly in the pandemic, and having two shows uh, in a row about this issue is our way of making sure that doesn't happen here. Absolutely. Let's go to video. Hey! This week, I'm really pleased to be joined by two excellent activists from my hometown, Leeds, um, who are going to be talking to us about a, a range of issues, really looking at the huge inequalities of outcomes um, that disabled people have experienced from the COVID crisis. Um, Emma Cat, um, where do we start with this? I just kind of, I'm sort of saying to Cat before we came, <laughs> that there was something I, I really wanted to talk about, and that was the fact that this inequality that we've seen for disabled people, that it's just symptomatic of an overall attitude towards us and towards carers. The fact that we're invisible, we don't exist, and we, our lives don't matter, um, and our rights don't matter, and that we're always come second best. You know, and you know, we're, we're told that we have to put up with more, do without care, so that able people can access that care and support. And that attitude just got you know just just hit the roof during the pandemic you know so we went from right at the beginning I remember I was sitting with my son we were listening to a radio program and they we were being told that um, certain people um, with disabilities shouldn't be having access to va ventilators because um, more able people should have more rights to them and my son was saying well, does that mean me and I said, I said, well, no, because I'm going to fight for you. And he said, yeah, but that means people like me, doesn't it? I said, you know, yeah. So we were already, you know, right from the beginning, there's I'd been the attitude that disabled people are, you know, not just our general rights, but our rights to life um, matter less. And in that climate, that's made people consider, feel that it's okay to be abusive towards disabled people and that's what I wanted to talk about really so I know sort of speaking to friends and family of, of other disabled people other carers that in the last sort of few months even the amount of altercations they've had with the public the amount of abuse that they've had to put up with has got worse since the pandemic so these are I guess what I'm saying is these are underlying problems that are already there but they've just been intensified by the government's attitude towards us as a group. So I <laughs> jumped right in there with that. No, no, no. I mean, that's really important. And, I, and that leads to my sort of next question. Does Where, where do you think this, I mean, we'll give we'll, we'll give Kat an opportunity to come here, is, uh, come in here. I mean, where, where, where do you think this this comes from, this uh, this hostility? I think we, we know that over the last year that um, disability hate crime has increased incredibly. There's The statistics are quite horrific, I think, in terms of disability hate crime. And I think it is set in the background, not just of the last 10 years, um, but really going right back into, you know, historical and the stigma that is still attached to disability and mental health. Um, and, you know, there's still such a, a basis in society that we don't, you know, that... that disabled people don't matter that we don't have value in society and I think there's a lot in the media that happened around 2010 onwards with the Tories in terms of the way that benefits were framed you know we had a lot of headlines of like benefits fraud um, and, and things like that and I, I think that you know, really uh, sort of skews the mind of the public as, as to disabled people and their role in society. Um, I think the other um, big issue is the rise of social media. Um, so it, social media can be such an echo chamber and particularly now it's a massive echo chamber. And like Emma, I've actually absolutely cannot sit and read social media comments anymore because for the last year, all I see is people who are disabled, um, 
they shouldn't have, like Emma says, no rights to, to ventilators. They, they don't have priority. Disabled people, if they know they're vulnerable, they should stay at home. They shouldn't go to work. They should just stay in so the rest of us can live our lives like we want to live. And I've literally read that comment so many times. I'm a person. I'm a partner. I've got friends. I've got family who love me. I have value in society. And um, as does every single disabled and neurodivergent person. And can you imagine if that was your mum who was sat in a wheelchair reading that comment that somebody thinks they should just stay inside and not do anything else for the rest of their life because somebody else wants the right to do what they want to do and not have to be in lockdown. And Whilst I get a lot of people have found lockdown extremely difficult, it's also been extremely difficult for disabled people, their carers and neurodivergent people. I've had um, limited access to medical treatment, which is, you know, I understand, I completely get that that has to happen. And, and I completely understand that the NHS has to prioritise. But the effect that's had on my life has been quite massive. Um, my though, And anyone who experiences a long-term condition and relies on regular treatment to be able to mend that that maintain that condition will have experienced a deterioration in their health. And for some people that could have meant that they might not have been as vulnerable before to COVID, but they're going to be more vulnerable now. Thank you for that. That was very comprehensive. Um, answer there. I wonder if we could bring Emma back in and just on, on just honing in on this, on this DNR issue. Um, I mean, this is really shocking stuff. I'm going to add something that isn't necessarily going to answer your question. But I think historically, disabled people are invisible. I said it before. And what was happening before COVID was despite the horrendous cuts that we've experienced, we did have this wonderful piece of legislation called the Equalities Act 2010. And suddenly, disabled people were allowed to have rights. And we had moved towards care in the community. We had children with disabilities able to attend mainstream schools, suddenly disabled people in all their complexities were visible. You know, we were in society and now we've had COVID, we've been told to go back into our houses um, and we're not visible anymore. I think historically, um, disabled people have always had less value. Uh, you know, if you want to think about it, um, right up until the 1960s, um, you know, we were looking at compulsory sterilization of, of learning disabled people to prevent them from breeding and polluting the, the gene pool. <laughs> you know, so we've already got that history. And even very recently, you've had, uh, you know, potential mothers of children with Down syndrome being encouraged to abort their fetus because they don't, because doctors don't think that people with Down syndrome should be born. You know, we've already got that culture in us. It's already there. And I think the government has just exploited it. So they could quite easily couch it in terms that, you know, the same with the ventilators. They could quite easily couch it in terms of cost. So we are, our lives cost too much. We are too expensive. And that, and if you look at the justifications originally for giving the DNERs, um, it, to learning disabled in particular, it was all leveled on how much care they need. So how much cost? This person have too much 24 hours care, right, issue them a DNR. So it was nothing to do with how physically well they were or how likely they were to die as a result of COVID. It was more about how much care do they need? And that was the justifications given for the DNRs. And it's still happening. And the tragedy, I mean, even if you buy into that logic, and I'm not saying we should at all, but even if you did, I mean, it's the, it's their fault for running the health service um, down and into the ground. If there's less people to provide the care, that, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not supporting that argument at all. I'm just saying that they're kind of, they, they've undermined their own argument. It's their fault that we, that on their own terms, we're at this place. Um, I just, I, I, I know. Um, Kat, you use the term neurodivergent um, a few times there. I think it's sort of quite important that not not necessarily everybody's going to understand quite what that means. Could you? I wonder if you could explain that for us. Um, yeah, so neurodivergent is part of the social model of disability. So we've predominantly got um, historically used a medical model where, you know, it's deficits that the person have just due to the illness or the, the health condition or disability. Um, and we, uh, from the 70s, a lot of activists have started to push for a move, move towards the social model of disability, where it's society that disables um, the individual. So it's not the fact that I have autism, or I have to use a wheelchair or any of those things. It's the fact that there's a there's not a ramp for me to get into the building. That's the disabling barrier. Um, and and the, the 
social model of disability has kind of evolved through that. So uh, neurodivergent normally covers terms such as um, autism, ADHD, Tourette's, OCD, um, certain mental health conditions often come, people choose to call themselves neurodivergent because we want to, you know, we're a different, I'm a different way of thinking. And so quite often I'll explain it to um people that I meet when I'm advocating for autism, that I'm just running a different programming system to somebody who is neurotypical. I am a Mac running uh, Safari and all of that and, and somebody out, you know, whereas most of the population runs on Windows. Um, and that's why the idea behind neurodivergence, it, neurodivergence is, is that it's not um, a disability in sense of, yes, the society's barriers can disable us, but that actually there's positives to having autism and, you know, some of these conditions. And we want to see the positive side of, of those things as well and be able to gain access by the fact that we the barriers are in society and not through the condition we have. I don't know if you want to add to Emma to that description. So I've got audio processing disorder. I'm part, I'm part of APD UK. Um, and that's often what we say, you know, I just wired breath differently. My, you know in, in my case it's to do with sound so my brain processes sound differently it doesn't mean that I'm stupid or I'm any different to you it just means that my brain works a bit differently to yours you know yes. and in some cases for some people some people with neurodiversity issues it's a strength you know that it's just that different way of thinking actually offers a lot of opportunities as well and it's just unfortunate our society is set up the way it is you know because it's missing out on so much and so I think that that's that's a really important thing to say. I mean, the, touching on the, the way that society is set up, I mean, there's got to be a causal link, hasn't there, between the reason why disabled comrades are unheard and, and disregarded and and the way society is, is set up. And uh, is, is it fundamentally an economic thing or is there something else going on here, do you think? I, I think there's a, a number of things. I think some of it is about education. I think some of it is about experience and I think some of it is coming down to economics. And and some people, I think as well, just, I think genuinely, sometimes there's the attitude, well, it's, it's worked for 30 of us. Why do we need to change it for two or three people? Um, not understanding that actually something that's accessible to everybody would encourage more people to organise, encourage more people to be activists and encourage more people to participate and have a voice. And um, I, I'm all very much a proactive person around access. I think we should make it as accessible as, as we can do um, and not wait for somebody to come and say, actually, do you know what? I need a, a ramp to get into that building. Um, let's find the building without that we don't need a ramp for that's fine a building that's got a lift or even better that's hold something on a ground floor that's got um you know appropriate for the people that we we have um and you know and anyone who potentially might might come along and start with that don't start with the building and make adaptations to it find the building start straight away um and and that works for everybody um but i think education is a is a really big thing i think sometimes people just don't understand the perception of somebody else um who's experienced a disability and on new or is new neurodivergent um i did a training session a few weeks ago and really and spoke about my experiences um, with autism. And I think a lot of people, I, I, I just never thought that, that that would be a thing. You can read autism on paper, but to actually experience it is completely different. Um, you know, people know I have issues with social, inter in social interaction, um, but they don't know how that necessarily affects me. And they just assume, well, we can see you talking quite confidently, you know, um, that's that you obviously don't have any issues. They don't understand actually, I go away, analyze everything that is said to me, and I have people who act as like almost like person translators who help me interpret social communication um, and and help me be able to understand that. So there's a, a lot of things that people just don't see that experience behind the person. They just see the person in the wheelchair. They don't understand their experiences. Um, my biggest phrase is if you want to know what it's like in a wheelchair, go borrow one and, and try to get around in a wheelchair because then you'll start to understand just a very tiny bit the, what it's like as a perspective of someone who's disabled. So I think there's a lot of education. Then there needs to be a lot of policy and there also needs to be a change in what comes from above. And in terms of if more of our politicians are talking about disability, getting angry about how we are talking, um, then more sound is going to be made and something's going to change at the top. And, and I do feel that it's starting to come through because, you know, I, I've spent um, most of February emailing other MPs um, 
some who were extreme, well, they were all extremely upset to find that the DNR issue was still going on and that it hasn't been resolved. And we're still waiting for, you know, yes, we've had an inquiry, but I don't think really the outcomes are strong enough that have come from that inquiry. And I think there needs to be a more public thing, but also that there needs to be a full inquiry into all of the uh, experiences of disability in in COVID. We're really interested to that. I mean, look, from, from everything you've said here, I mean, this, this, this really, to me, this feels like it's, First of all, um, comrades like yourselves are really on the front line of the fight against Tory austerity. Really, I mean, there are, there are few people as adversely affected by it. Um, it is. It should be like fundamentally about our values should be fighting alongside people like you. So why is it not more of a priority, do you think? Firstly, I think it's, it's, it's activist burnout. And that's certainly something that's happened amongst uh, disabled students. That's why... You know, because the people that fight for disabled students are other disabled students and, and you know, all the advocacy that happens in universities is by other disabled students. And because we've been so badly hit by COVID, most of that activism isn't happening because people are dying. You know, <laughs> we, it's very difficult for us to fight for ourselves when we are ill and, you know, and, and we're, we're dying from COVID. How are we supposed to fight for ourselves? Um, why do... Why does the left ignore us? Because it's easier. And I think one of the big problems that we have in the left, and, and I think socialists need to, you know, we've got a big wake up call here, is that you need to accept that there is intersectional issues and that you have to accept that everyone has been affected by the prejudice in society differently. And we have to accept that. And th those stories are important, um, you know, and, and just complaining at us and saying that, um, you know, it's all about identity politics, um, as if this means nothing. If you want to understand capitalism, you need to understand how all these disparate groups are being specifically targeted and victimised, and you need to give them a voice. And that is where the problem is within the socialist movement. You know, I have often been told, you know, that I have to wait for my equality until after the revolution. You know, we just after this next election, after this next campaign, then we'll make things accessible. Then we'll listen to your stories. You know, that needs to stop. We need to start representing disabled people and all vulnerable groups, including black and brown people, you know, LGBT people. They need to be represented and it has to happen from the ground up. And I think that's what the problem is. I think the problem with the system is that it's very hierarchical and that nothing gets done unless we do that through our MPs, who are very busy people that don't necessarily prioritise disabilities. You know, I mean, I know CATS had some success with our MPs, but that's only as a result of badgering them constantly for the last few months. So <laughs> as, as, as rank and file activists, people watching this programme, how, how can they help? How can they show solidarity? There's multiple ways to show solidarity. I think one is a, is helping us raise awareness. So being, you know, one thing I constantly have asked RCLP to do is, okay, if you see an article about DNRs, share it. If you see the owner statistics, share it. So social media is that's one really simple thing to do. Share articles from, you know, valid sources um, that are showing the plight of disabled people and, you know, celebrating what they also achieve as well. Um, and, and that's one very simple thing that takes two minutes to retweet something from Fran Francesca Martinez, who often tweets about it. Keep shouting for us when we can't because we can't shout all the time. And, you know, I, it's taken a long time, I think, to, to keep shouting in CLP meetings, to keep having the same conversations and keep raising things and keep that profile really high. But we need our left comrades to be doing that as well for us. We need our trade union comrades to be doing that for us as well. Because I, I, I mean, Emma knows I sat in TUC workers, disabled workers conference the other week and I, I literally was just in bits because even though I know all of that, hearing it all, was just horrendous and, and actually hearing people's life stories of what they've had to deal with in COVID was just absolutely heartbreaking that no person should be have to feel like that. It's inhumane. Help us raise our voice, write to our MPs for us, write to, you know, organisations if they've something's been ableist on TV, write and complain. Don't let, stop not calling it out, start calling out ableism in the same way that we would do racism, in the same way that we did homophobia and transphobia. Start calling, dis, you know, ableism out. I think the only thing I would say is that um, I appreciate when comrades try to make things accessible for me. I really do appreciate that. But ask first, 
Yeah, that, that's all I ask because we have a lot of well-meaning people in a, in our local Labour Party that just they think they find this one thing like a ramp to a building, um, and they think that's going to help out all disabled people without asking. So you know, just ask, ask what what do you need? You know, I think it's that big phrase, isn't it? Nothing about us without us, and I think that has to be the mantra. Nothing without nothing about disabled people without disabled people. Um, and I think that goes to every area of activism, really. Talk, you know, talk to people, talk to disabled people, find out the issues that neurodivergent people are experiencing. And, you know, there's a big campaign at the moment about the justice system and neurodivergent people. And that's an, another area where people could really be very supportive and active. There's consultation on that at the moment. You know, don't ignore these things you see on social media. Do something about them, but talk to the disabled and neurodivergent people that are in your organisation and, and make them part of, 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 of access and of organising. Kat, do you have a final message for our audience um, this evening? I guess my final message is to all my um, trade union colleagues and all my colleagues within the left and within the Labour Party. Please, can you show, please just, we need your solidarity. We need your voices. We are important. We make up an important part of trade union organisation. We make up an important part of the Labour Party. And, you know, we need to all have everybody shouting about everything. So, you know, if we're shouting about something, shout with us and support us and email our MPs and email government. And don't think just because we're in a corner and we're, we're not as many people that it doesn't matter. We, we totally need your voices and we need your solidarity. So, yeah. Yeah, just, just all disabled people and particularly carers full-time carers uh unpaid carers carers of disabled children carers of disabled relatives you are not alone okay and you can get support and solidarity from people just like you and i would like and i would hope that the labor movement can offer you that support and solidarity because i've got a lot of help from those networks and a lot of that's come from labor Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. That was a really fascinating com- um, conversation. Um, I'd, I'd really like to have you both back on at some point. Um, Emma, I'd, I'd love to hear more about uh, disabled students and the campaigning around that. I think that's a really important issue. Um, Kat, I'm sure there's lots that we could talk about. <laughs> we covered a lot of issues there. Um, but listen, thank you both. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, you know, solidarity and um, and all the best for the future. Thanks for your time. All right, well, it's lovely to have uh, our fantastic guest, Ellen Clifford, that we had on last week, back to talk to us again, having watched that uh, really important piece by the two activists from uh, from Leeds. Ellen, uh, activist from Deepak, an author of The War on Disabled People. You must have found that quite moving the same as I did. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that struck me uh, the most was the point that Emma said she really wanted to get over was about how she's made to feel invisible as a disabled person in lockdown. Is that an experience that you've heard before? Yes. I mean, I think the fact that there have been so many COVID related deaths of disabled people, I know used the figure last week, but six out of 10 COVID related deaths have been disabled people. And yet there wasn't the kind of outcry that I think disabled people would have liked there to have been in reaction to that. I think people have felt that our deaths have been invisible and overlooked. And and that's an indication of how society overlooks our lives as well. A lot of the difficulties that disabled people have been experiencing under lockdown just don't seem to have been really acknowledged or, or on the radar anywhere. Disabled people are just absolutely terrified. because of the the very serious risk of catching COVID, then if disabled people and people with underlying health conditions do catch it, they're more likely to have a serious case and to have serious long-term effects. And then there's also the issue that um, that the NHS has to uh, ration treatments. So at times when there is pressure on people who have underlying health conditions are deprioritized for life-saving treatment. So people are very scared that they're going to get ill, but but won't actually receive any treatment. So people are living with this this terror, uh, but they feel that they've just kind of been pushed aside as as vulnerable and just kind of told to stay in. And 
you know, you hear people who want the want society opened up, the economy running, want to be able to live life as usual again. Uh, when you hear people saying, well, just stay at home if you're scared, stay in. People really feel that that demeans everything that they've been through for the last year. Um, and, you know, within within disabled people against cuts, I think I probably said this again, again last week, but around half of the activists that we've lost since we started in 2010 have been since January last year. So we're coping with a lot of lot of grief and bereavement at the same time. And yet those issues don't really seem to be on the, the mainstream radar. Yes, there's a lot to unpack in what you've just said there. But, <laughs> you know, one of the things for me is I think we've kind of been sold the idea that maybe a lot of these people who were disabled who've died and the people who were elderly who've died, well, maybe they were going to die anyway. Maybe they were very ill. You know, maybe it was nearly their time. But actually, um, the reality is that 25% of people are disabled and that actually a lot of the workers who've died, 800, over 850 NHS and care staff have died and a large number of them were disabled. But they were obviously, they were key workers. <laughs> just like these two women that we've just watched today, you know, Emma's a teacher, uh, Emma's a, a carer and Catherine's a teacher. The key workers, you know, really valuable members of our society. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about who actually counts as a disabled person. I think people have kind of an image of the of wheelchair users in their head. And of course, some disabled people do use wheelchairs, but there's a whole range of, of different people who make up the group as disabled people. And actually in, in frontline jobs and low paid jobs in particular, disabled people are disproportionately represented. And it's not, it's absolutely not inevitable that the people who, who have an underlying health condition are going to die prematurely. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there, there are treatments around that didn't need to happen if different political choices had been made. But I think also in terms of, of people people's deaths, how people die really matters when it comes to our loved ones. Um, so, for example, in, in Sweden, um, Sweden's so-called herd immunity project uh, which ended up with disabled older people in care homes being denied any treatment whatsoever and actually uh, in the first wave of the pandemic they were giving them palliative drugs illegally by non-trained medical professionals which hastened their deaths and for some of these people yeah they were only months away from dying anyway but when their relatives found out about this it was how their loved ones had died that mattered so much to them. And the fact that they were, <laughs> well, that, that they were deliberately denied treatment and their deaths brought on prematurely. Um, but it was also the fact that they were alone at the time. Um, and I think that, you know, what's wonderful, I think, about people is that we, we do care about each other and that it matters to us what happens to those, those we love uh, and how they die. So I, I think that that actually is underestimated sometimes when people just think, you know, don't really think about what death means. I think just, you know, get the economy running again. Mm, that's that's terribly sad, isn't it? It's terribly sad. But I also think you touched to get there on an interesting point. This idea that we do care about each other, because my experience of lockdown is that actually people have been fantastic in looking out for their neighbours, in wanting to support their local community, in when the government have failed to, you know, to support uh, children who are hungry in the school holidays, in stepping up in the most incredible ways, wanting to support people. But yet the, the narrative that's pushed at us is that actually it's dog eat dog out there and the people are hoarding toilet roll and, and that actually we don't care about each other because some people, you know, in the establishment want us to think that, that we're, you know, that, that there is no such thing as society. Uh, but actually, I think we've seen different. I hope people have seen different. Yeah, and that, that was what always really got me about Cameron's big society idea that people needed to volunteer more. And who was he talking about? He's talking about the working class need to get out there and volunteer more. But but we all do already, I think. Our lives are very interdependent. I mean, disabled people more so because we have to be. But I think people do care for elderly relatives already, for example. We do look out for our neighbours. Under lockdown, I think it's certainly been been emphasized because it's been been difficult times but I think we all do that 
anyway. And yet, as you say, Jane, this this narrative is pushed that we're all selfish and, and individualistic. Uh, and I don't think that's I don't think that's actually true. No, it's not us that are selfish. <laughs> yeah, it's no. the people who are running society that are selfish. Yeah, yeah. My God, that's true, isn't it? Absolutely. People who've you know stuffed their friends' mouths with money at every possible opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. And have capitalised on the pandemic as a way of making more profit. I thought what you were saying there about invisibility uh, was really interesting. And in particular, uh, the fact that a lot of disabled people have been, you know, locked away during lockdown. You know, I, I couldn't help think that we used, you know, I used to read novels uh, when I was growing up, set in the Victorian period of um, nasty men that kept their uh, that kept their disabled wives in the attic. <laughs> and, you know, I used to think this was such an arcane idea. But it's really what we've gone back to in lockdown in some ways. And I, you know, how 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 do you feel about that? Is that right, Ellen? Is is, is that how it feels to you? Well, actually, for a lot of disabled people, what they said at the beginning of lockdown was that this isn't any different to the way we've had to get used to living for the last 10 years. Because as disabled people support packages and social care support has been been cut so much that a lot of people do now spend the majority of their time inside behind closed doors. And the United Nations Disability Committee actually came up with the term reinstitutionalization pretty much for the UK context, where they were thinking that we'd, we'd been, you know, disabled people have been liberated into, you know, the right to live in the community, but then with individual support being cut back, people were just being pushed back behind closed doors, just like that kind of attic idea actually so you know there's a, a blog by a, a really good disabled activist in Wrexham Nathan Lee Davies and, and I remember he, he him saying well you know I'm used to just looking at the four walls of my bungalow all the time so there was uh, an element from disabled people of kind of welcome to our world at, at the beginning of lockdown but obviously things have become a lot more intense since then on the other side there have been an upside and for some disabled people, they've actually felt more included within uh, political organising than ever before because people have had to start doing the things that we were doing all along, such as remotely connecting. So there is, there has been this kind of upside as well. It's quite contradictory because obviously some people, particularly like people with learning difficulties, can't use, you know, might not have support to, to ha use online technology. <clears throat> so certain people have been totally excluded, but for others, they felt more included than before and we really hope that kind of when we build back better that some of this will be incorporated. Mm, that's interesting I hope you're right and I think actually for all sorts of groups Zoom's got massive potential you know including women who found you know they've been excluded because of childcare mm. issues uh, they've, they've found that they can be more included in Zoom. In it's It's great it's great that we can find new ways to build back better as you say Ellen. But are there other ways in which we can help disabled uh, comrades to feel less invisible? How can we help with that? I think really being aware of the campaigns that we're pushing and, and getting on board and supporting. And I know last week we talked about the 20 More For All campaign, which is about the fact that disabled people um, have had higher expenditures through lockdown, mainly as a result of, of shielding, but also needing to pay for PPE for, for the social care staff coming in their own homes, because it's actually up to the individual disabled person to, to pay for that. And yet legacy benefits haven't received that £20 uprating so I think getting on board with, with those campaigns particularly because you know with so many people shielding and people are still going to be shielding and, until after the second vaccination or until people feel you know feel it's safe to where they have that option of course let's not forget that, that on the 31st of, of March uh, legal protection for, for disabled workers who were previously shielding ended. So, you know, there is that going to be those pressures on, on disabled workers now to stop shielding. But those who can are going to carry on until they feel safe. But what that means is we can't go out and protest like we used to. And that makes us feel, and I'm sure does result in us being a lot, a lot less visible. Um, so I think it's particularly important now why we want, you know, allies to, to come on board to, to help amplify our voices. 
Mm. I think that's that's key, isn't it? Because, I mean, uh, the, the, these two activists talked about nothing about us without us, which is really central and important. And I think sometimes people feel a bit like I, do, I don't want to say anything about disabled issues or black issues because I don't know anything about these subjects because that's not my lived experience. But at the same time, amplifying those voices, that's really important, isn't it? Yeah, solidarity and allyship. And I think it, it's fine when people come from a social model approach where people understand disabled people's oppression. I think particularly where we don't like people speaking on our behalf is where it's done um, in, a, in a way that kind of reinforces dominant narratives in society about disabled people as passive victims or you know recipients of uh, of care rather than as contributing to society you know that plays into that idea that disability is personal tragedy where people are speaking about us in ways that reinforce those those kind of negative ideas that's really when we start to have a problem um and, and that's why we really encourage people to to learn about the social model and to become confident talking about disability Mm. No, that's a it's a really liberating model, isn't it? I think, and I think education uh, absolutely key, isn't it? Yes, but I think, I, yeah, I think the social model can teach teach us all something, even if we're not disabled. Um, I think it really teaches us very powerfully um, about how canny capitalism is uh, at uh, at changing the way we well. Uh, at framing the way we think about issues. The fact that people have this idea that, that people with impairments and illnesses are inevitably excluded from society, or, you know, or like we were saying earlier, well, their deaths were going to be inevitable. But actually, there's no reason that under a different structure of society, with different living under, you know, a different socioeconomic system, actually, people with illnesses and impairments can be included. Um, with, without uh, needing this category uh, of disability. The fact that we have this idea or the idea in mainstream society is so entrenched in people's heads that disability is this, is this personal tragedy and we have to pity and look after those people, not seeing like you were saying earlier about people being able to contribute as key workers, for example. Those ideas are so fixed in our heads and we can really see, I think, when we start to, to look and understand and analyse disabled people's oppression, how there's kind of the, the, the dominant ideas come from the ruling class and really can shape the way we think unless we're consciously questioning all the time. I thought it was really good to watch um, to watch Kat and Emma today. I think they are really inspiring women who, you know, were, were telling us all about uh, how they've been made to feel uh, and how they've had to shout really about their right to life, uh, about their right to, um, to, you know, to treatment and so on. And yet, actually, these are key workers in our society. It's it's it really is worth watching and worth, I think, re-examining what we've been made to feel about disabled people, because a lot of it's bollocks, isn't it? <laughs> Complete bollocks, yeah. Fantastic uh, to talk to you, Ellen, a really inspiring woman comrade, just like these two other women. The idea that you ought to be, you know, lower down in a queue for a ventilator, what a load of rubbish, completely blown out of the water, talking to you three today. I hope for everyone. Hey, thanks for talking to us today, Alan. It's been fantastic as ever to have a conversation with you. Keep on doing what you're doing. You do fantastic work. Thanks, Jane. You have too. <laughs>well um another well another fantastic set of guests there i mean as you said at the start jane ellen literally back on by by popular demand i thought some really important points made there by by all of our guests it's a real privilege to have these people on and listen to their experience and their, their knowledge um what was your highlight for from the guests this week um i think listening to them talk about the social model i find that really interesting because it's just pure liberation politics Absolutely. As a socialist, that's what I'm interested in. I want to liberate everybody. I want you know everybody to feel feel that they can be themselves and that they can live their own lives and be free. And that's what that's all about. So I think that's the most uplifting thing that I heard.
Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's like, you know, there, there is nothing inevitable about the oppression and the sidelining of disabled people, just as there's nothing inevitable about inequality, about racism, about any of the, the huge issues that, you know, we we fight every day. I think the flip side of that is to hear um, that uh, when we've got six out of 10 COVID deaths are happening to disabled people um, and to hear all of what uh, Emma and uh, Ellen and Catherine were talking about, to then hear them say that their issues around disability are often dismissed as just identity politics. Really, people need to give their head a wobble, don't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Jane, uh, really, real real pleasure to have you as co-host again this week. Uh, thank you so much. Do, do you have any final thoughts on this week's episode? Just, I just wanted to say, I, th- I thought those women, they're so inspiring what they're doing in our society. There we've got, um, you know, Ellen, who's writing books that are changing people's whole perception uh, of disability. We've got um, Emma, who's a full-time carer uh, for, her, for her son. And we've got Catherine, who's a teacher in one of our schools. These are people who are contributing hugely. Uh, and the idea that in any way, they ought to be low down on a queue for a ventilator or that their life doesn't matter as much as everybody else's life is absolutely blown out of the water, isn't it, Matt? Absolutely, absolutely. So there you go. Thank you for for watching uh, this week. Um, as we said last week, you know, um, don't let your you, don't let people with disability be invisible in your community or in your activism or in your campaigning. They are vital, vital part of our society. They have as much value as as any of the rest of us. Um, so please uh, support support those comrades. Educate yourself about the social model. Uh, question your assumptions and perceptions around this stuff Uh, sometimes that's challenging but I think we've all got a lot to learn from one another um, and from each other most importantly do not go gentle into that good night watch educate agitate organize every Saturday night thanks and we'll see you next week thanks Thanks, Jane